as we think about Christmas time, probably one of the things that we enjoy most about Christmas is this sense of wonder that accompanies Christmas time. And I think for children, that sense of wonder at Christmas just comes fairly naturally. It comes, wonder comes naturally to the heart of a child, doesn't it? Especially at Christmas time, because there's wonder that com- for, comes for them from the lights on the tree or driving through the neighborhoods. They see the lights on the houses at night. It comes from the smells in the kitchen on Christmas day or Christmas morning, maybe Christmas Eve, whatever your family traditions are. It comes from seeing, the wonder comes from seeing all the presents piled up under the trees. And so for, for children, that's just a natural thing. There's this childlike wonder that crops up in their hearts. And I think for us, as you, as you grow up, that's one of the disappointments of getting older and becoming an adult, because you lose some of that natural ability to experience wonder in your heart, don't you? And so we as grownups, we go looking for that long, we go looking for the wonder in other places. So you see the commercials and they're so ridiculous. I mean, even if someone surprised you with a ribbon wrapped Lexus in your driveway, I don't know who does that. <laughs> People with too much money is who, do, who does that. You might appreciate and, and, and revel in the wonder of your, of your new luxury car for maybe several months. I mean, even beyond that, you would be happy that it's your car, but you wouldn't carry that sense of wonder anymore. That would eventually leave you. And soon enough, your luxury car would just simply become the new standard. And that's just your, that's just your regular car, right? We look to technology, new technology to give us that dose of wonder that we want. So if you unwrap your new iPhone, whatever number we're on now, I don't even know, or your Samsung, what is it, nine? Samsung, if you open your new phone, maybe for a few weeks, you got that sense of like, it captures your imagination and there's a sense of wonder that's in there. But probably after a few weeks in all likelihood, and if you've ever gotten a new phone that you've been really excited about, you know that within a few weeks, it just becomes your phone, right? Until a mere three or four months later, the next iPhone comes out and then you're back on the same cycle again, right? That's just how it works for us. It it can't sustain and supply that longing for wonder that, that we want so much. None of those things can satisfy our longing for wonder. They burn out like matches. It's like psh, you light a match and there's that spark and it's, there's a glimmer there and it just burns out in a matter of seconds. The story of Christmas, on the other hand, can satisfy that longing because unlike a burning out match, the, story, the true story of Christmas is like a crackling fire that you can sit in front of and there's wonder and glory in it. If you'll take time to take it in, if you'll take time to sit in front of that crackling fire and enjoy the wonder and the glory that's there inside this Christmas story, there's wonder and glory. I connect those two words. I think they go together. Glory is a word in the Old Testament um, in its root sense that refers to weight or heaviness. When applied to God in the Old Testament, it speaks of his immeasurable greatness. It speaks of his beauty of moral perfection and his intrinsic supreme value. And so when, so when we long for wonder, to experience wonder, we're really longing for something glorious. We're longing to experience something great, something beautiful, and something intrinsically valuable. So we're longing for wonder is really a longing for glory. Now, this is what I want us to see in the story of Christmas, of all places, starting here in Isaiah chapter 40, looking at some of the prophetic announcements of the coming Messiah. And so really the Christmas story starts all the way back in Genesis when when. Satan comes in the garden and then there's this promise of the seed of the woman who's going to crush the head of the serpent. So the announcement of the good news starts all the way back. So all the way through the Old Testament, we're coming up to the prophetic literature, to the book of Isaiah. And there is wonder here and there is glory here in these verses that we just read about Christmas of all things. And so what I want to do is, 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 is look in this and hope that you experience some of the wonder and the glory of Christ at Christmas here in Isaiah 40. So just to give a quick overview, the first, if you've ever read Isaiah, you know that it's pretty depressing for the first about 39 chapters. So the first 39 chapters are mostly these announcements of God's impending judgment upon the ancient uh, nation of Israel for their unfaithfulness to God. There are some promises there of the Messiah coming that is super hopeful there in Isaiah chapter 11. There's a promise in Isaiah chapter 25 that connects with what Lindy just read in Revelation 21, where God is going to do away with death and all suffering, he'll wipe all tears from our eyes. So there is hope in there, but for the most part, it's judgment for the first 39 chapters. And then there's a turning point in chapter 40, where Isaiah begins then to speak of comfort and hope for God's people and the ultimate restoration of his people, Israel. And ultimately going even further through the chapters to the end of Isaiah is this hope for the restoration of the entire world. And so verse one then is this turning point in Isaiah 40 that begins like this, comfort, comfort my people says your God, speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry for her, that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned. So the God who judges, rightly so for our evil, for our sin, 
is also a forgiving God, a God who pardons for our iniquities. And he has not left his people without hope or without comfort. So comfort and hope now are held out as a promise to God's people in this passage and in beyond, which points forward to the coming of Jesus some 700 years later. So at the time that Isaiah wrote this, it's about 700 years before the birth of Christ. And already he is pointing forward to this hope of the coming Messiah, this comfort and hope that's promised. And so I want to look at this promise here and I'm going to condense it for us into three unfolding pieces. And the first piece of the promise is that God is coming. That's the first piece of the promise. God is coming. Verse three says of Isaiah 40, a voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert, a highway for our God. Now, all four gospels in the New Testament identify this voice crying in the wilderness as whom? Who is it? Do you know? It's John the Baptist. It's John the Baptist. He's the desert dwelling, camel hair wearing, locust eating prophet in the wilderness. Just, I imagine him wild eyed and kind of crazy here living out in the desert. He's not a clean man. And he's there and he identifies himself as this voice crying in the wilderness. So how crazy. This man is on the scene for 400 years Israel has not heard from a prophet from the Lord for 400 years, just total silence. They had the scriptures, but no prophets that were speaking, thus saith the Lord. And now John is on the scene and he's saying, I am this voice in the wilderness crying, prepare the way of the Lord. I'm that guy who 700 years ago, the prophet Isaiah prophesied about, I am him. That's what he's saying. And what is he now saying? What is John the Baptist's role as he shows up and identifies himself as this voice? Well, he has come to prepare the way of the Lord. He's clearing the way for God to come to his people. And how is he doing this? He's calling the people to repentance from their sins. And he's pointing people to Jesus. That's his role. He says this in, in, the, in the gospel of John, not to be confused with John the Baptist, the, the apostle John, who was a follower of Jesus, wrote the gospel of John. He says this in chapter one, verse 29. This is the gospel of John, chapter one, verse 29. John the Baptist speaking about Jesus. He says, behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is his role. Behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is important to remember at Christmas time because with the festive nature of Christmas, with sparkling lights and hot chocolate and Christmas parties, we have to remember that Jesus came because of human rebellion against God. Jesus came because of our sin against God. He came to take away our sins. And when you understand that, then that becomes the occasion for rejoicing. You see what I'm saying? So there is reason to have a party and to drink hot chocolate and to put lights up because the savior has come and dealt with our sin. That's good news for us. So then Isaiah 40 promises God is coming. What's he coming to do? What is God coming to do? That's the second part of the promise. So God is coming to reveal his glory. God is coming to reveal his glory. Look at Isaiah 40 verse five. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So how is the glory of the Lord going to be revealed? Through the coming of Jesus Christ into the world. That's how God is going to reveal his glory. Fast forward back again to the gospel of John chapter one, verse one, very famous verse. We've talked about it here before. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. So the word is, is God himself has always been fully God. And and that's supported by, if you keep reading through John chapter one, verse three says, all things were made through him. If all things were made through him, what does that make him? The creator. And if all things were made through him, that means he himself was not made. He himself is an uncreated being. He is the creator God. Now, who exactly is this word? Because it's kind of Uh, enshrouded in some mystery. So you have to keep reading into the gospel to get some context. You keep reading down to verse 14 and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. This is none other than Jesus. The word is Jesus. Jesus is the one who spoke the universe into existence by the power of his word. I'm terrible at creating things. I'm horrible. I, I can't build anything. I would love to be able to just speak and create. That's what he does. That's what he did. So the creator of the universe spoke the the universe into existence and he created you. He created you and he became a human being and lived among us. Does this spark any sense of wonder inside you? I mean, an iPhone is just a, a match that burns out in seconds. 
This is a crackling fire that you should sit in front of, that we should sit in front of and, and, and take in the light and take in the heat of it. A roaring fire to warm you, to comfort you, to enthrall you. You ever watch people at summertime when they, when, when they sit around a campfire? It's like it's, it's the only place where it's perfectly okay to just do this and not talk to anyone. And that's normal. If you just do that on your couch when you have people over there, like, what is wrong with him? <laughs> it's okay to sit around a fire. And, and we are invited to sit around this fire of the incarnation at Christmas time. There is glory and there is wonder here. Isaiah 45 promises that the glory of the Lord will be revealed. The glory of the Lord is going to be revealed through Jesus. Now let's read the full text of, of John 1, 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Listen, and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. So Jesus Christ being born into the world is the very revelation of God's glory in the world. Namely, the glory that's seen most clearly in, the, in God's character of his grace and truth. So glory sometimes in the Old Testament in the Bible means this manifestation, this visible light of seeing that. But that's just because God knows that, that we need to ha see, have a picture visibly of how great he is. And so sometimes he appears and his glory of the angels, it's, it's basically a, a visible picture for us to see how magnificent God is in his essence and in his character and in his nature. And his glory here is most expressly revealed in the world through Jesus Christ, in his grace and in his truth. And, and Isaiah says, all flesh shall see it together. This doesn't mean that when Jesus showed up, everyone in the world saw that he was there, but all flesh means all humanity, referring to the fact that Jesus Christ is the Messiah for the whole world. He's a universal Messiah, not just a savior for the nation of Israel, their savior, yes, but savior of the world. And Isaiah then would add to that, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken, which means he will do what he says. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. His promises are sure. And so what Isaiah does here now is he contrasts the permanence of God's word with the impermanence of human life and the shortness of it. Human life is like grass and flowers. They spring up and they grow quickly and then they fade quickly. It comes up quickly and it goes away quickly. Anyone with kids knows how fast life goes by. Like we can't keep up with our clothes, our clothes budget. We've got to to up for the next year because they're just growing like weeds. And how do you not fit in those shoes? We literally bought those shoes a month ago. I don't understand. So, so you know how fast life is going by. Anyone who's lost a loved one, we prayed this morning and talked about the Bonar family, knows how quickly life goes by. In fact, I was in Starbucks and I was, I, I had just written this down about how, I was on this verse, written it down about how short life is. And that's when I had a phone call conversation with Brian about Kayla. And I thought this life Life goes by quickly. Here is our anchor. Here is our hope of the promises of God. His word stands forever. Verse eight says, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Which is to say that God will fulfill every promise he's ever made. Do you know the unfailing promises of God in his word here? These are given as an anchor for your soul which can anchor you in the brutal storms that you are going to face in your short-lived life. God will keep his word. And as it comes to this promise of the Messiah, God has fulfilled and is fulfilling this threefold promise. That number one, God is coming. Number two, God is coming to reveal his glory. Third part, number three, God is coming to reveal his glory as the shepherd king. There's the promise. Verses nine to 11 is this, this heralding. This is the gospel Going up to the high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Same words used in the New Testament of proclaiming the gospel, the good news. The good news is that God is coming to reveal his glory as the shepherd king. Two pieces I want to cover, king and shepherd, shepherd king. So verse 10 reveals that he's coming as king. Behold, the Lord God comes with might and his arm rules for him. That is a picture of a king, of incomparable power. The king of creation is coming to the world he created. Now, Matthew's gospel tells us, famous passage. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men, or magi, came from the east, came to Jerusalem saying, where is he who has born, been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. 
So these pagan astrologers, this is a picture of the gospel being universal in scope. Did you know that the very beginning of Matthew's gospel, which is the most Jewish of all the gospels, has the most quotations from the Old Testament. So he's assuming most of his audience is Jewish, but it starts out showing that there are men, pagan, basically astrologers, magicians of a high court who are coming to to worship the king. So salvation is universal. How does the gospel of Matthew end? Go into what? In all the nations. You see that? So he is a a universal Messiah for the world. And so these these pagan astrologers, they follow the star to where Jesus is. And Matthew tells us, and going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshiped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. Now this is an amazing and sweet irony here in their heartfelt worship. You've thought about this? They're giving gifts to the one who is being currently given as a gift to them. They're giving gifts to the gift. And that's really what all worship is in essence, isn't it? Is that we are giving gifts to the one who has been given as a gift to us. We give to the one who gave his life for us, even though he doesn't need anything. Have you thought about how weird, in a sense, worship is in that, in that regard? What can you give to him who doesn't need anything? God didn't create us because he needed us. He wasn't lonely. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a community of persons from eternity past. But God in his kindness decided to create a world to share relationship and to share love and joy and life with the people that he created. So in our worship, we give to God what to to someone who doesn't actually need anything. But I think there's a, it's a, it's a cool picture of people giving things that they value, things that are valuable to this King. So my question for us or for, for you is what can you give him this Christmas to express your worship, understanding he doesn't, he doesn't need anything from you. So the things that they gave here, gold and frankincense and myrrh, these were valuable things. What are valuable things in your life that you can give as an expression of worship to Christ? So we have our material resources. Okay, does God need your material resources? No, but he entrusts money and finances and material resources in your hands to use them to invest in eternal purposes. Don't store up treasures here on earth where moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal, but invest in the kingdom of the heavens. Invest in heaven where where thieves don't break in and steal and moth and rust don't destroy. So how you use your money, whether it's giving to the local church and to to gospel ministry or to missions around the world is a way that you can give a valuable gift in the name of Christ to one who doesn't actually need you, but invites you to participate in the joy of being a part of his work. What else is valuable in your life? We know that time is valuable. Time is extremely valuable. And so I'm thankful for for, for those who have a vision in their life of following Christ who give their time to serve others. That's a part of our worship to Christ is, is giving of our time. I think about this, sleep is valuable to me. Sleep is valuable to you. Would you be willing to give up the valuable commodity of your sleep, whether it's early in the morning or late at night so that you can sit in front of that fire? of Christ and warm your heart in front of there and to just be with him and just to commune with him and just to worship him as you see him in his word. There are things that we can give him, not because he needs it, but because we need it. He doesn't need us to give it to him. We need to give for the sake of our own hearts so that we're honoring him and we're experiencing life with him. These are benefits that we can gain just by, by, by giving away. And then we see this picture of worship here and they rightly recognize him as a king. I don't know how they figured it out. There was some revelation that was happening there. You can tie back to Numbers chapter 24. There's this promise of a star. I don't know how they figured it out, but somehow the Lord led them there and they honor him as king. Now, this is really important in the biblical story because if you know the Old Testament history, 2 Samuel chapter 7, God promises King David that he is going to have a descendant from his line that will one day rule a kingdom that will never end that will never end. His dominion will be an everlasting dominion. And then if you know the birth story in the gospel of Luke, you know that the angel Gabriel shows up to the young woman, Mary, and confirms how mind-blowing is this? That she's pregnant by the power of the Holy Spirit and has conceived a son, and he will be this king that all of Israel has been longing for, waiting for. They've been exiled. They've been killed by Assyria. They've been exiled off to Babylon. And they're like, where's the promise of God? Where is this Messiah? Where is this king you promised? You'd expect him to show up in a palace. He does not show up in a palace. Not a palace like Solomon's. Where does he show up? In a barn. In a barn. 
And the angel Gabriel says to Mary, he confirms, this is the son that you are carrying. You shall call his name Jesus, which means God saves. He will be great and he will be called son of the most high. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. I mean, that is mind blowing. I'm carrying the child that is going to rule the world forever. Now, when he came in his first, the first time, he didn't come as, as they expected. And I, and I don't blame them for expecting a conquering king to show up, right? Because you got Isaiah chapter 40, verse 10 here, and he's, he's ruling with his arm and his strength. So that's who they're expecting. So God did not fulfill their expectations. And, and this is much of why Jesus was rejected because he didn't fit their expectation of what this king would look like, what he would be like. When he shows up, he doesn't show up as a conquering king. He shows up as a humble king, born in a barn in Bethlehem to die on a cross in Jerusalem. Nobody saw that coming. Born in a barn in Bethlehem, ultimately to die on a cross in Jerusalem to reconcile sinners to himself. That's his first coming. Now, he will return again in his second coming and he will return a victorious and conquering king and he will judge the nations and root out all wickedness and evil and he will renew and rule the entire earth. That's part of the gospel. That is a good promise. It's what we look forward to. It's what we've been, what we read about this morning. So Isaiah 40 verse 10 promises the king is coming. And then verse 11 tells us what kind of king he is. He's a shepherd king. He's a shepherd kind of king. It says verse 11, he will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. So verse 10 pictures him as a powerful king, one whose arm rules for him. What's he going to use this strong arm to do? According to verse 11, what's he going to use his arms to do? He's going to use his arms to gather up his lambs. Isn't that amazing? He uses his strength for the sake of tenderness. So Jesus is the perfect combination of strength and tenderness as a shepherd kind of king. He's going to, he's going to take his, she- his sheep and he's going to bring them and carry them to his chest. I think of the Bonar family, again, Jesus carrying them in his arms, daily bearing them up. Psalm 68 says, um, the Lord, the Lord, blessed be the Lord who daily bears us up. God is our salvation. The shepherd King Jesus bears us up. He takes us up in his arms. So when you wake up, whatever you're going through, and you don't feel like you can put one foot in front of another, you don't feel like you can even stand on your own and somehow you've made it months whatever you're going through, if you know Christ, it's because he's carrying you. It's because he has, he has brought you to himself and he's held you tight against his chest. That's the kind of shepherd king that he is. That's the nature. That's the character of the shepherd. Now, Ezekiel 34 is an important chapter on shepherds. God testifies against the rulers of Israel, whom he calls shepherds. He says, ah, shepherds of Israel, In verse two of Ezekiel 34, all shepherds of Israel who have been feeding yourselves, should not shepherds feed the sheep? So the problem with God's rulers, the problem with God's kings is they're they're using their authority and their power to serve themselves. And that is so common of human leadership. Is it not in the world? To take this authority and this power that we have and use it to, to pad our own wallets and take care of our own needs at the expense of the people we're supposed to be serving who are under us, we as their leaders. And God says, I'm not going to tolerate these human leaders anymore. I'm not going to tolerate these shepherds because you've been feeding yourselves at the expense of my flock. Now, listen, I'm going to read you a passage from uh, Ezekiel 34 verses 15 and 16. Listen to how many times God uses the pronoun I, what he's going to do. Listen, I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep and I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost and I will bring back the strayed and I will bind up the injured and I will strengthen the weak. I will feed them. Justice. Did you hear how many times God said that he himself is going to shepherd his people? That's the, that's the character of our shepherd. He says, I, I, I'm going to do this. You're not doing it. So I myself am going to do it. Now it's very strange though. Cause you keep reading through Ezekiel 34, you get down to verse 23 and God's saying, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And then verse 23, and I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant, David, huh? He shall feed them and be their shepherd. Wait a second. God just said he himself is going to shepherd his sheep himself. 
I myself will do it, he says. And then in the next breath, he says, David, his servant's going to do it. What is going on here? David, by the way, is a prophetic shorthand for Messiah. So the question then becomes, who's going to shepherd the people? Is it God or a human Messiah descended from David? Is it God or is it a human? Is it a human or is it God? You see where this is going, right? You see where this is going. The gospels resolve the tension for us over the identity of this divine human shepherd. Matthew chapter two, again, King Herod asks the religious leaders where the Messiah was to be born. And they reply with the words of the prophet Micah from chapter five. And they say, and you, O Bethlehem in the land of Judah are by no means least among the rulers of Judah for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. So clearly the gospels are saying this shepherd is Jesus. They're, they're announcing it here. Matthew is announcing it in his gospel chapter two. And if, if the tension doesn't totally get resolved, if you go back to Micah, because it says this one who is going to shepherd God's people, Israel, his origins are from eternity. What? His origins are from eternity. So, so he seems to be eternal. And yet he seems to be a man. Again, there's no doubt about the identity of the shepherd from the mouth of Jesus himself in John chapter 10, verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. So you have Israel longing for their king to show up, their shepherd king to show up, who would gather his people to him and carry them against his chest and comfort them and help them and feed them and give them life and and help them in their weakness. Where is he? Where is he? Where is he? And here's Jesus. I am the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. He is God and he is man. He is the king's shepherd, the shepherd king. This is how God supremely reveals his glory to all flesh in the world through his gospel. It's through this good shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep. So the glory of God is supremely seen in the cross of Jesus as he lays down his life for the sheep, as he lays down his life for our sins. If you're in Christ today, if you're in him today, if you know him and you have salvation in him, you were lost. You had strayed. All we like sheep have gone astray. Isaiah 53 says, first Peter quotes that as well. You had strayed from him. You had walked away from him. And he went and he found you. He came to seek and save the lost. When Jesus says that in the gospels, you automatically should think back to Ezekiel 34. God says, I'm going to search for my sheep. I'm going to find them. I'm going to bring them back. If you're in Christ today, he searched for you and he found you and he saved you. Are you here today? And are you tired? Are you exhausted mentally, physically, emotionally? Or do you feel worn down? Well, he promises to make you lie down and rest. That's what he says. I will make them lie down. Are you hurting? You feel injured in some way, whether physically or emotionally, he will bind you up is what he promises. Are you weak? You feel weak. He will strengthen you. Have you suffered injustice at the hands of other people? Then he promises to give you justice. He promises to make all things right. It may not happen in this short lifespan that we have, but the King is coming back and all will give account to him. And he will put all things right. And he will give you justice. If you have suffered the injustice at the hands of other people, God has promised to comfort us, to comfort you. If you're in Christ, put your hope in him through this shepherd King. Do you know him? Do you know him as a shepherd? Is Jesus more to you than an abstraction? Just a good idea. Like it seems like a good idea to believe certain things so that I can clear my balance and make sure I'm okay in case I die. That's not the picture of the shepherd. You're missing the person himself, the shepherd, Jesus. Do you know him? If you don't, if you're not convinced, you need to follow him. Start where John the Baptist started. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent means confess your sins, turn away from your sins. I don't want my sins anymore. I want Jesus. I don't want sins that bring death. I want forgiveness and life in Jesus. That's what I want. And that's the invitation to you. He will be your good shepherd. He came down to lay his life. Same passage, John 10, right before the the statement about I'm the good shepherd. He says, I came that they may have life and have it to the full or have abundant life. So he came to lay down his life so that you could have abundant life. That's why he laid down his life. To give you life. That's the promise of the good shepherd. So would you, as we're in this Christmas season, prepare the way in your heart for Jesus this Christmas. And my prayer is that God would fill your heart and mine with, with just wonder at his glory revealed in Jesus. Let's pray.